Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am Ian R. Buck, normally your host, but today's episode is a little bit different. I was invited to appear on the IEEE RAS Soft Robotics podcast, hosted by Marwa Eldawini. Soft robotics is the field of making robotics out of softer, pliable materials rather than just rigid pieces of metal, which is what we typically think of. Most of her episodes so far have been interviews with researchers and people who are working in the soft robotics field, but recently she has started interviewing members of the general public about how robotics has affected their lives, which is where I come in. We chatted about how robotics is used in high schools, in home automation, and how it is impacting society in general. If you'd like to listen to more episodes of Marwa's podcast, search for Soft Robotics Podcast in your favorite podcast player, or look in the show notes of this episode for links. Those show notes can be found at thenexus.tv slash TED50. Quick note on the sound quality in this episode, I'm very, very sorry, but I did not realize that Skype was set to use my webcam's microphone instead of my studio microphone when uh, when I was on the call with Marwa. Um, normally, I'm just recording straight into Audacity, which I knew was uh, set to use my studio microphone, but I did not double check Skype. So please bear with that for just this episode. Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from Pulse Academia and Industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. Hello. Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Ian R. Buck. Um, I live in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, United States. Um, I am a technology podcaster and a computer science teacher at a secondary school. Cool. So I would like to ask you first, when you were a child, what is the first time you heard about robotics and how you feel about it? Mm, I mean, I feel like my first exposure to the concept of robotics was through science fiction, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I was I was very big into Star Wars uh, when I was a kid. I kind of lived and breathed that whole universe. Um, and of course, you know, they have droids in that uh, in that universe that are considered people, right? Uh, they they still have yeah, like like they're they're still controlled by their programming, but um, but they you know exhibit a lot of aspects of like free will and, and autonomy um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, personhood, uh, approaching personhood. So that was kind of my first uh, exposure to the whole thing. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm only 27 years old. So like, as far as I can remember, you know, we've, we've had uh, mm -hmm. robotics working in, you know, uh, factories in in uh, manufacturing contexts and stuff like that and you know so I've always been aware of of that kind of automation as well mm -hmm. so have you ever built a robot uh, when you was you at school or yeah yeah you know I I don't think I really had any opportunities to do that as a student mm -hmm. uh, but now as a teacher I am one of the uh, advisors for the robotics team at uh, at my high school um, we do the first robotics competition which is uh, building like when, when I joined the robotics team I was kind of expecting it to be like Lego robotics mm -hmm. you know building these small little uh, machines that would like drive around on, on a tabletop and you know do simple tasks but uh, no we're building you know these large metal framed uh, robots that uh, drive around on a large field uh, trying to you know gather items and bring them to particular goals uh, Mm -hmm. along with, you know, like six other, five other uh, robots on the field at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So as your teacher, you're teaching them the robotics for the student. 
if once you ask you what is a robot is, how you would define it from your experience to robotics in general? Yeah, I would define a robot as any mechanical piece of machinery that can operate on its own without without a direct human, um, you know, controlling it in real time. So there definitely is a an aspect of the programming that goes into that, um, whether that's you know a completely deterministic algorithm that uh, that you write to you know tell the the robot when the sensors get this input when it reaches this threshold, uh, then do a particular thing. Um, but, you know, of course, it, it can also, uh, that kind of model can be trained via uh, machine learning or, you know, some other um, artificial intelligence kind of setup uh, so that it can figure out what the best actions are to, to do to uh, reach its goals. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, what is really interesting about your job? Because you're teaching the student in high school, which is before they can choose their goals, whether to work in engineering field like robotics or AI or something like that. So what's something interesting about your job as a teacher? And what's something really you think it hard when you deliver concepts about robotics and late stuff about technology, about robotics? Yeah, I think the, the most interesting thing for me about my job is that I I get to really take this this area of interest of mine, this area that I'm passionate about, and you know it, it has become my job to stay on top of like what are the latest uh, goings on in in this uh, field without actually you know working directly in the field, um, which is a, a unique challenge on its own. Um, and then I guess the the most challenging part, about teaching uh, students about robotics and about computer science in general is that um, currently at least, you know, computer science is treated as a, an elective. It's not a required class. Um, most of the classes that I teach don't have any like prerequisites. So just any, any students uh, with mm -hmm. any background can take them. And so I end up with a, a wide range of students who, you know, some of them are very, very interested in the topic and want to learn as much as they can. Others are just there because, you know, they had a gap in their uh, in their schedule and their counselor needed to put them somewhere. So mm -hmm. they end up in my class. Um, that's that's less of the case uh, in the robotics team, you know, because that is an after school activity. And so all of the students are there uh, are there because they're really interested in either, you know, physically building the robot or programming the robot or, you know, there's many different parts for them to, to you know, mm -hmm. yeah. latch on to, um, but they're all there because they're actually interested in doing it. Yeah. So when you're just teaching, like, there's a question that comes to your mind as a teacher about robotics stuff, like a question you think, oh, maybe there's something is missing here in this, in this robot, like, we have many robots, like, military robots or social robots or intelligent robots. Do you have any questions pop through your mind? Will you prepare before you deliver to the student or attend the class? I, whenever I'm preparing uh, for class, I always try to think about like what what do I consider to be the most important things for my students to know mm -hmm. uh, as they go into this world where robotics is, you know, and, and computer technology in general is going to be so pervasive that they can't, you know, they can't avoid it. They can't live without it. Um, so I'm not necessarily looking at it from the lens of like, what do my students need to know if they want to become engineers or, you know, whatever I, I I'm thinking of it, you know, in a more holistic sense about, you know, um, some you know a mixture of, of technical skills uh but also teaching the students kind of like what what frame of mind should we be approaching all of these these new challenges with um because yeah like wh whether you get a job as a uh, a, a programmer or an engineer building a robot um or you you know get a job as a plumber like you're still going to be interfacing with this technological world in some way mm -hmm. 
So as you are a millennial, so how do you see the progress of robotics since you became aware about robotics? How do you see the progress in our daily life in general when you read about it? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot more consumer facing um, products that, you know, fit into the robotics kind of um, wheelhouse. Uh, you know, m most of those are marketed as toys and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, but also it's, it's, you know, more and more possible for those of us who are interested in, you know, making something that, you know, just does a simple task for us in, in our own daily life. Like it's very cheap and easy to uh, put that kind of thing together. Um, you know, like it, it, I could very, very easily like buy a little Raspberry Pi, uh, attach like a, um, a sensor onto it that can detect uh, vibrations and just set that on top of my um, dryer and mm -hmm. then uh, have it send me push notifications when the dryer stops vibrating. And there you go. I didn't need to buy a smart dryer or anything like that. Uh, I have just made myself a little system that uh, that notifies me when my clothes are done drying. Like, mm. yeah. And of course, there's there's also the less visible but they you know it, it touches our lives in very profound ways as well that like robotics uh and automation are affecting um our workforce our, our economy um and so it's the the kinds of jobs that are available and how many jobs are available is uh very very um Mm -hmm. It's being affected in, in very profound yeah. ways by robotics. Yeah. So if I ask you what is the most mind-blowing robotics you have ever seen and something scary as well, what was something mind-blowing and scary for you in robotics you have witnessed or see? Mm, honestly, I think that the progress that has been made in the uh, self-driving cars mm -hmm. uh, area is, is the most mind-blowing to me because there's... There, there are so many different variables. There's so many different things that, uh, you know, a driver is going to encounter when they're on the road. Um, you know, even, even, even if I, you know, travel like, you know, to another state here in the United States, um, you know, if I go from Minnesota to Wisconsin, like, things like the, the character of the road is just slightly different. The, the road signs look different. Um, and, you know, so, so the fact that, that uh, technology companies have been fairly successful at programming, at, at creating uh, self-driven car systems that uh, can navigate in a wide variety of different environments uh, is pretty amazing, even if we don't consider them to be quite ready for the road mm -hmm. just yet um you know i think that the progress that they're making is uh is pretty incredible mm -hmm. so do you think that you could trust something like that said a driving car if it's not really prepared but in the long run could you trust a machine to uh, to like a self-driving car could you trust it oh for sure like yeah if, if we're talking far enough down the road where <laughs> down the road um where you know these things have been tested and you know they've been given the green light uh you know by like uh federal regulation agencies and stuff like that like mm -hmm. yeah I, I have i have no problem trusting uh, an algorithm to to drive around um because like like well we wouldn't we wouldn't give that kind of thing the green light if it wasn't, um, if it hadn't been demonstrated to be at least as safe as the human drivers who are currently out there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, I, I have no trouble like trusting my personal data to countless algorithms that, uh, you know, exist on like Google servers. Uh, and so like I, I don't see it as too much of a stretch to like, you know, trust our physical safety as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you in the class, if there really students come to you and talk to you and say this may be misconceptions, he maybe argue about something in robotics, like uh, for example, human like robots, some student doesn't like the idea that having a robot resemble them. So in general, do you think that's 
maybe there's misconceptions that even um, lay people or kids or any when you encounter they have there are misconceptions about robotics have you ever seen misconceptions yeah for sure I'm, I I can't think of any off the top of my head um, but you know I, I do yeah I, I always have students who think that a particular technology works in some way um, and you know in those cases like I th this is just you know teaching technique of course but like you know I, I always do my best to not make them feel stupid because they have been told something incorrect in the past mm -hmm. and you know just uh, um, present the the correct information uh, in you know in a kind and thoughtful way um, and yeah, because it's it's very important uh, for for I think our students and and for you know our our citizens to have like uh, you know a well informed understanding of of how these technologies work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I ask you about the intelligent robots, how you would see intelligence if just more beyond what is actually exists? Something comes to my mind, and you can imagine I want this to be intelligent, supposed to be like that in robots. So how you would define intelligent robots from perspective now, and later on, what you expect intelligent robot would be? Yeah, that's a really tough, that's a really tough question because um, I don't think that we really have a great understanding of like what it is that makes us as humans, mm -hmm. uh, you know, intelligent and separate from other animals. Um, but you know, something something that would that I would have to consider intelligent. It would have to you know be able to um, make decisions on its own. You know, and of course, like we have machines like the Mars rovers that are able to uh, you know make some some amount of decisions uh on their own because um there's a there's a time delay in in when nasa can get information back to it um but uh yeah like some some level of of autonomy for sure um self-awareness you know like mm -hmm. knowing knowing that it is a being that exists in the universe um yeah i i don't see the the Turing test as a very rigorous uh, test for whether something is intelligent or not. Um, that's the the test where a a an artificial intelligence uh, is you know in like a text chat with uh, a human judge, and they have the human judge has to figure out whether whether the uh, entity that they are conversing with is uh, a human or an an artificial intelligence. Um, yeah, I don't I don't see that as a great test um, because, you know, you can you can very easily not easily, but, you know, you could definitely program something uh, with many, many, many different responses um, and and not have it really be uh, really understand uh, mm -hmm. what it's saying. Um, yeah, I, I I have no idea how we'll know when we have created uh, an artificial intelligence that you know mm -hmm. that should be counted as like a person and have all the rights and responsibilities uh, thereof. But uh, I look forward to that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think that a human can make really emotion toward robots, like has been highlighted in movie like here? Or this could be sort of hype and misleading lay people how really a technology we have capable of already. So do you agree with this kind of delivering that we can have emotions already towards robots since we already we have robots for helping elder people or for loneliness, but we don't know whether this really make a progress in coping with their loneliness. So do you think these robots can really we can have emotion towards them? Do you agree with this concept? Yeah, I definitely think that people can have emotional attachments with with robots. Like we, I mean, we see people with emotional attachments to much simpler machines uh, mm -hmm. that that don't exhibit, you know, traits of intelligence. Um, and you know, I, I think I recently I don't remember what podcast this was on, uh, but I, I remember hearing about a particular um, like smart home assistant 
type device that I think came out before, you know, Amazon's Echo devices. Um, mm. And the, the company that made it uh, was not financially viable. And so they had to shut down the servers that uh, kept, kept these uh, assistants online. And you know, a lot of a lot of the consumers, the people who had bought them, uh, who had like crowdfunded them originally, um, were very very sad to have this like what they had kind of come to to view as like another member of the family um, leave their lives. And uh, yeah, so I definitely think that as as our artificial intelligences uh, become more sophisticated and, you know, as they're able to uh, overcome the, the uncanny valley in, in particular yeah. ways that we definitely will, will have people, humans who uh, have emotional connections with, uh, with their machines. Yeah, that's interesting because you like uncanny valley and I would like to highlight the, about the Japanese robotist Mori. He said that since I was a child, I have never liked looking at fake wix figures. They look somewhat creepy to me. And, and that's why I'm asking you, I don't know really whether you think that this is, could help people who suffer from loneliness. How you make a robot conscious? Because now we don't have a conscious robot, I think. But do you think this something could really make a progress uh, to helping people? Yeah, and I and I think the key there is that like the uncanny valley is is a little bit different from person to person. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember when uh, the Star Wars movie Rogue One came out, and you know they had used um, CGI to recreate uh, Grand Moff Tarkin's face and likeness, uh, and you know he like the the actor who originally played him has been dead for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and you know some people looked at that and and thought wow that is amazing that looks just like him uh and i looked at it and went that's very creepy i don't like that at all mm. uh so you know it, it it varies from person to person uh on what uh what their reactions are going to be to a particular um a particular like computer generated or or robotics uh you know a robot that's acting like a human um some people will will see it and and think like it looks very natural or it looks very cute mm -hmm. um and other people are going to be uh creeped out by it mm -hmm. so yeah i think i definitely think that there is potential for using robotics to help uh combat loneliness um mm -hmm. because yeah like you you don't you really just have to be able to trick the brain into thinking that it is having those uh, quality social connections with other people. Um, yeah. It sounds a little bit dystopian when I say it that way, but... <laughs> yeah. But do you think this would be like a competition between, if we speak that in the coming 10 years, for example, and we, do you think that would be a competition between the human and robots? Since now we witness that a thumb organization using now like artificial intelligence algorithm to hire and recruit certain people based on certain answers that set by, by uh, the algorithm. And it's kind of somehow for me at the like dehumanizing workplace, uh, maybe sounds creep a little bit, but I don't know how you would see this cooperation between human and robotics or intelligent machine that can recruit. Do you think there could be synergy between human and robotics and intelligent machine? Or is this something that could be impossible since there is now strides to using intelligent algorithm to recruit people since a company like Unilever used this in recruiting a process? Yeah, so the effects of robotics on the economy is probably the aspect of robotics that I have thought the most about. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I think there, there are definitely some jobs that are more easily automated than others, right? You know, so manual labor, mm -hmm. um, manufacturing, um, but also, you know, we're seeing a lot of tasks that like normally would be done by a highly trained, uh, you know, like a doctor who has spent 10 years training on, you know, how to recognize a particular uh, type of ailment, you know, by looking at uh, at imagery and, and data from from scanners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're developing algorithms that can 
uh, recognize those things uh, with with greater accuracy than than these human doctors. And um, yeah, and I think I think that like um, social labor, emotional labor, is another one of those things that uh, probably gets overlooked a lot. But yeah, if if um, if you can have robots that um, you know can provide care for uh, people um, can provide social connection, uh, then yeah, there is there is some potential for those like jobs uh, being taken by machines uh, that uh, that normally we would have had a human doing. Um, the the only the only sticking point that I can think of there is that, you know, like the the social connection isn't just one way, right? The the person who is being cared for isn't the only one who's benefiting from that uh, scenario, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the the other the the caregiver is also uh, benefiting from that social connection. Um, so that's that would be one reason that that might not, uh, you know, completely be taken over by, you know, robots. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like, like, I think that our economy is going to be be vastly changed, uh, by automation and robotics as we go forward. Um, because, you know, we, we don't need to have, uh, we don't need to achieve a world where like every single job is um, taken by robots mm-hmm. in order for it to completely change the economy. You know, there's mm-hmm. kind of a, there's there's just a, th- a certain threshold that we have to hit. Um, and the, when I look at like the lists of, of jobs that, you know, employ the most people, uh, and I see that like, for example, here in the United States, mm-hmm. uh, trucking, you know, transportation has been the biggest employer, uh, consistently over like the last 30 years. Uh, and I realize, okay, self-driving cars are going to completely change that dynamic. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we're going to definitely have to figure out different, like, we're going to have to put some sort of economic and social structures in place to support everybody um, as we move into this world where like employment is not going no longer going to be viable because uh, most of us will not be able to compete with the you know cheap labor of uh, of robots and algorithms. Mm-hmm. And that's a very interesting point, and I, and that also leads to a question about the social inequality since you highlighted the truck driver in the U.S. for example. And it's an uh, economist based on capitalism, and that's why I don't know how the decision maker or companies who make these decisions would consider cheap labor or people like truck drivers and the lube. And that's why I don't know what you think could be solution, since no one may be highlighting these points about the long term uh, consequences behind the technology. Yeah, it's like traditionally there has been somewhat of a balance between yeah capitalists people who control uh the the large amounts of money that it is required to produce things um and you know those who sell our labor for you know in exchange uh for money you know when that labor is no longer needed um is is now too expensive um then you know that's all of that that wealth that's being generated is going to be accumulated by the people who already have capital and so i think that like one of the only there may be other solutions but one of the only solutions that i can think of Mm -hmm. is if we put in place um a system you know governmental most likely uh to like tax all of the companies Mm -hmm. that are benefiting from automation Mm -hmm. um and redistributing that wealth to literally everybody, Mm -hmm. um, regardless of whether they are employed or not employed, or if they, you know, already, um, own stakes in, in those companies or whatnot. Um, you know, so a universal basic income is probably going to be necessary, uh, or at least desirable in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, you know, of course, countless challenges to overcome before we can put in place a system like that. Um, chief among them, the fact that like nations are also in competition with each other, right? So if one country decides, okay, we're going to put in place a tax to do to, you know, achieve those goals, 
then companies will probably just shift their production to a different country where the, those taxes don't exist. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, yeah, and I mean, we're, we're already seeing that kind of thing with companies that, you know, mm. move their, their wealth around, you know, between different bank accounts in different countries to avoid as many taxes as they can. So, yeah, it's like, do we need to have one large world government that mm. coordinates all of those kinds of things? Um, one world government is, you know, typically associated with kind of dystopian uh, science fiction novels, yeah. but... <laughs> You know, I, I don't think that it's necessarily uh, a bad thing. Mm-hmm. That's a good solution. I, I hope that could happen. Um, so I would like to ask you about the high robotics. For instance, Sophia Roberts, the, when she has granted a national uh, for Saudi Arabia. This kind of hype, uh, how we would see it uh, and who was responsible for it? And also, what do you think about having robotic anchor women? And in China, they now try this to make a robotic anchor woman. I don't know what could be the benefits for me. I don't, I don't know what's the point for placing. Of course, there's there's a good side of robotics in some certain scenario, but for this scenario, do you think this is really important to investigate and having this kind of robotics in this scenario? Yeah, I'm not uh, familiar with those two specific examples you gave, but yeah, as as for like who is responsible for um, for what a robot does. I, I definitely believe that like the people who created it, who, um, who programmed it uh, are responsible for its actions. Um, it is, we do get into some, some tricky situations where we have like robots being controlled by uh, an algorithm that was created through like machine learning or something like that, mm-hmm. where, the, you know, there wasn't a, a particular human who, you know, put in like specific thresholds uh, around, you know, when when this thing happens, perform this action. Um, it's mm-hmm. it's much less clear, yeah, like who who is responsible there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's yeah, it's it's impossible to ask the creators of uh, you know machine learning. Um, algorithm to have tested every single like possible outcome mm-hmm. uh, that might arise. Yeah. Yeah, that's, very, that's a very tricky question. Yeah. And also, I don't know when you allow like a teacher or when the student maybe go home and talk about robotics in general because there's lay people who are not involved in, in technology or digital market. And it sounds to me that every in the coming years, every jobs will be centered around the technology like robotics or AI in perspective, or maybe digital world. I don't know how do the lay people who are outside this t- sector recognize what is happening or it is like a hype for them. Do you have any kind of discussion with people who are outsider from the, this, this perspective? Oh yeah, it's always fun when I, um, you know, go to Thanksgiving dinner or mm. you know, like meet up with uh, the the in laws during you know Christmas vacation or whatever, mm. and um, you know they they have lots of questions for me about uh, various different things that they've heard about you know in the in the news, but you know of course they they only hear about them in the context of you know what um, what the New York Times has been writing about it or you know the, some other. Uh, mainstream media outlet, um, which yeah, hopefully do a good job of providing context, but they don't always uh, they don't always do that. So um, yeah, that's and that's one of the reasons that I I make podcasts is because I am very interested in trying to make like like. I'm interested in being a communicator around mm-hmm. these kinds of issues um, and and bring a a technology focused uh, perspective that's still digestible by um, you know a, a broad a general audience. Um, that's one of the reasons that I that I do what I do. <laughs> Great. So there's a question. Do you think that you are concerned about how would human would use robotics now and, and, and recently. Do you think this kind of not good uses for robotics or potential uses, do you think you are really concerned about it? 
Um, yeah, I'm mostly concerned with like robotics being used to perpetuate current, like already existing uh, power imbalances between people. Mm -hmm. um, like what? Like, um, you know, if, if uh, I guess this isn't necessarily robotics, but you know, when, when algorithms are used, when data is used by like um, police uh, agencies or by mm -hmm. like judicial courts uh, to make decisions um, that supposedly, uh, you know, are, are have, have removed any identifying data, removed like demographic information so that, you know, it, it can't possibly uh, be like discriminating against people, um, mm -hmm. but it, you know, the algorithms often still find ways to do that because they're being trained on uh, data from past like court decisions mm. uh, where of course those court decisions were made by flawed humans who mm. have their own um, biases and so that's that's the kind of uh, thing that that concerns me the most I'd say mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah that's a very interesting point and and that's why I would like to ask you and since we are human and we do this design whether robotics or people expert in AI, what do you think that could be a solution for getting rid of the bias? Because certainly we're human, we are biased. This is something we all know. But when you have something like an apps like algorithm that decide every single maybe significant decision in your life and certain people who have the authority to put this algorithm and give it to organization, whether to um, as you highlighted in the police sectors or other organizations. What do you think could be the solution for that since we have the leading companies? Is it related to the recruiting process because we targeting certain people from certain demographic regions? What do you think could be a solution since we see this bias happening in many examples and become like an alarm in the last uh, few months as we see many scenarios about that? Yeah, I, I think that like more oversight is definitely needed. Um, not just oversight for the organizations that are putting these algorithms to use, but also oversight for, from the algorithms themselves, um, you know, building in systems uh, for these algorithms to kind of explain, highlight, you know, why they made the particular decisions that they did. Mm -hmm. So when we when we look at the outcomes and we see, okay, there is some disparity here between mm -hmm. like what the what what we wanted the algorithm to do and what it actually uh, came out with, um, then we can hopefully uh, and of course these these like neural networks are mind-bogglingly complex mm -hmm. so um yeah tracking that kind of thing down is very very difficult um and and you know so like supporting organizations like the electronic frontier foundation i think is key um because they you know that they are their express purpose is to keep an eye on these kinds of issues so that um you know lay people like you and i don't have to know all of the ins and outs of, uh, of a particular um, technology, of a particular issue, um, but having these like, yeah, whistleblowing organizations that can uh, keep, keep governments and companies accountable um, is definitely important. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see how we would see the policy makers, the relationship between the robotics and policy makers uh, and because, for an example, in China, because we see some like re-identification algorithm where they can restore the personal data of certain citizen, and this is kind of worrying for some people that how we can use this algorithm or robotics in in general. So, how we would see this technology when we have the like a robotics developed or a machine a learning for certain applications is, is developed. How you would see this integration between the policy and uh, and the technology? Yeah, um, <laughs> getting yeah getting policy to line up with best practices when it comes to new technologies is very challenging mm -hmm. um, because quite often, like the the people who are electing our policymakers are these everyday citizens who don't necessarily. Uh, they may have a lot of misconceptions about um, technology, about robotics, um, or, you know, who 
aren't really thinking about this when they are uh, voting for people. Um, it's it's not generally a topic that uh, gets brought up in, at you know big debate stages. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I I would I would love to see that changed, um, but I don't see it changing anytime soon, uh, mm. unfortunately. So yeah, I, I mean at the very least we should we should try to support you know policymakers who um if they do not have expertise in a particular area um that they at least you know are smart enough to listen to and trust and try to understand Mm. the experts in those fields uh and you know make decisions based on uh, based on that Mm -hmm. great so do you think that any decisions that has really significant impact shouldn't be made by a machine since we now have Elon Musk and have the Tesla cars, and it sounds like it's maybe some people have argument that it's too early to have this kind of technology that people can use. Since we is not really reliable yet, and other with this idea. So I don't know what you think that you are with to to trust early and uh, try to see how the technology going with people and getting the feedback shoot first and then get the feedback later or just we have to wait and make sure it's reliable right yeah um i guess the the flip side of that question is um why do we trust humans to make these kinds of decisions you know because uh all all of the problems that we've had uh throughout the years have also come from you know humans Mm. making Mm -hmm. uh terrible decisions uh, on behalf of everybody else. Mm -hmm. So yeah, trusting an algorithm to make those decisions, you know, it doesn't seem like it's that big of a difference uh, conceptually to me. Um, I mean, just like we, we want to make sure that we have like good quality people making decisions for us, whatever good quality people means, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, We also want to make sure that we have good quality algorithms that will uh, make the decisions that we want um, in place. So yeah, like designing those systems, testing them rigorously um, before putting them in place in in a real world environment uh, is, uh, yeah, that's that's what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you if you were in this position, what kind of steps you can do to make sure that the technology would be beneficial to humanity as all, as all. Yeah. yeah, I, I mean, with without knowing exactly what you know the algorithm that we're talking about is is you know what its purpose is, um, it's hard to say specifics about what to you know what kinds of things to make sure that it does. Um, but you know, in general, when you're whenever you're doing anything in computer science, you want to make sure that you're not just testing from expected uh, inputs and outputs, but you know also expect or testing edge cases um, and you know unexpected situations. Um, and you know, the the group that I would say has like the most. The, the best track record of testing things and you know having having systems work even in unexpected situations would be you know like NASA or some other space agency. Um, they of course have had their fair share of screw ups in the past, but uh, I think that they have had a, a far better track record of uh, successfully implementing things. So, like following their their kind of models for how they set up um, their systems. Uh, you know, I, d- I don't know exactly how many different people they have testing equipment and you know and algorithms and things um, and and or what exactly their processes are. But I expect that that would be uh, a good model to follow. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you, there's a video about Boston Dynamics and there's one of uh, working there uh, which just kicking the, the robot. And some researchers say that we have to design a robot to resist the pain. Do you think this is something like ethical? Because some people say we have to be ethical to work as a robot. And others say it just doesn't have a feeling like us. Do you think this is something we have to really to be respectable to robotics or is this like kind of hype of thinking 
What do you think of this thought? Yeah, I mean, there's like when we when we think about pain, the way that humans experience it, there's like two different aspects to it, mm -hmm. right? There's there's sensing that damage has been done to our bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, And then there is the emotional response to that, right? Um, and I, I think evolutionarily, we developed this emotional response to pain because uh, that was the best tool that biology had to encourage self-preservation, you know, in in organisms. Um, and you know, then self-preservation promotes like uh, an organism is, is more likely to survive and procreate and pass on its genes. So that's mm -hmm. why I think that trait has, um, has, has made its way through, you know, down to, to our population today. Um, I think, you know, from, from a robotics standpoint, um, they're like robotics, of course, are expensive machines. Mm -hmm. And so building in some level of self-preservation is desirable. Um, so having sensors that can alert the robot when, you know, some damage has been done so that it can uh, seek out, you know, or alert um, whatever entity is going to service it and, you know, help repair it and whatever. Um, but I don't, I, yeah, I don't think that we would want to uh, give a robot like the same emotional response mm -hmm. to pain, to damage, uh, as humans have. Um, yeah. Though, though, if, if it is a robot that is in a scenario where it is supposed to be like interacting with humans on a social level, right. Uh, it would be desirable to have the robot at least act like it is having the same emotional response to pain as a human would um because then it you know that's more relatable um and it avoids hopefully avoids the uncanny valley yeah so do you think that because like for example go master player decides to quit the game because ai was too good as he said mm. do you think this is something because it's like it, there's like if you because the machine now is not really smart enough as a human It's just like, like, like we have to say that it's still dumb. It's not really intelligent enough. But when you read something like that, what you can, what comes to your thoughts when you read like Go Master Player, who was, who was doing well for many years, quit because AI is too good in in the Go game. Yeah, I mean, there, there's always there, there are always tasks that we, um, you know, are, are pushing the boundaries on, and we're always thinking like, okay humans are like this, this is too complex a task or it, it takes you know that that certain something that humans have that robots will never have and and they'll never be able to surpass us in this um and you know of course the the exponential growth in um not only in computing power but also just in the the uh techniques that we use for developing um robotics and artificial intelligence uh i think i think that that is not quite like it, it's not it's not a predetermined destiny that that robots will exceed us in just about every way but i think that that is the most likely scenario um now that that master go player who quit did he quit like um playing go entirely or did he just quit from like that one round no it's just completely yeah Just completely. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think that that is uh, not a like that. That's the kind of response that we want to avoid. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, if, if we if we're in if we're living in a world where um, there's no reason for anybody to like have a job. Right. Um, if we live in a post scarcity world where we can get what we need uh, just through machines, through automation, um, then, yeah, we need to figure out how people are going to, like, what, what is their purpose, right? Because currently in our society, mm -hmm. um, so much of our purpose is tied up in our identity as a worker, right? When, mm -hmm. when you had me introduce myself at the beginning of this episode, most of the things that I talked about are things that I do for employment, right? Mm. Uh, I, 
I'm a podcaster. Well, I don't make very much money at that, but it is a thing that I do, right? Um, I spend a lot of time doing it. Uh, I teach and, you know, so like, the, like my identity is, is tied up in the, the things that I do that, that are valuable to society. Um, and so I think that we'll, we'll need to find models. We'll need to find ways to value ourselves outside of of that uh, outside of like what value we are providing for society or we'll just have to find different ways to provide value for society um but yeah like when 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 machines can create just about anything that we as humans can create like how do you do that Mm -hmm. um I like you could you could say, okay, humans like maybe we'll all become poets or we'll all become podcasters or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, once we have algorithms that can just produce uh, audio that sounds just like me Mm -hmm. and that can say all of the things that I would ever think of um, before I've ever even thought of them, then like, uh, I mean, what is the purpose? Uh, I guess, you know, yeah, I, I, I have to I have to find my own self-actualization oh. uh, yeah that's very really interesting and creepy at the same time how we would use it and that's like a deep fake videos and images and I was like yeah. I was asking okay that's interesting but what is the purpose behind it because I don't know what could be the good intention behind it if we say if there's a good intentions behind it but I don't think so I don't know what you think yeah, I think the the companies that were making the uh, the technologies that are being used to like yeah overlay or like generate new audio or overlay like somebody's um, yeah. like new expressions onto somebody's face, mm-hmm. uh, they were developing them for use in like um, movie production in Hollywood, mm. um, so that like you you wouldn't have to if if like a particular line needs to be like re-recorded. Um, the studio doesn't have to pay to get the actor back in the studio, um, oh. but instead they can just like synthesize that actor's voice saying this one new line and then uh, just insert that into the movie. Is this legal uh, when you have the sound of a certain actor? Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, that, mm. I don't know if, if our current contracts even like yeah. uh, cover that kind of thing because that's probably something that no lawyer ever thought of before this technology was invented. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, do you th- that, that's something for you. Like, sounds creepy if we don't even have like regulation because there sounds there's no regulation for this kind of deepfake videos we see or images. Yeah, and I mean, I think that we, we, as a society, we went through this kind of thing, you know, 15 years ago or so when um, Photoshop, you know, and other mm. image editing software become became widely available. Um, suddenly, you know, you're seeing uh, lots of images that, uh, I mean, people are putting together lots of images that were clearly like fantastical and could never have happened in real life. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's also fairly easy to uh, create images that are just slightly different than uh, than what the original was and mm-hmm. it paints a very different story. Um, society didn't crumble because of that. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't think that it's the like end end of the world the way that some people have been talking about it mm-hmm. um, with these deep, deep fake videos and everything. Um, we're just going to have to, yeah, learn learn new ways of verifying information um, before publishing it. Mm-hmm. So how do you see the competition between tech companies? Because I think in robotics, we don't have so much companies in robotics, only that's Romba in, in the market. But I don't know how you see the competition uh, now and what do you think from perspective makes technology survive for a longer time? If we speak about robotics in coming years yeah, to survive. I, I mean, as an as an outsider, I've never like worked in uh, the technology field. I've always worked in education. Um, yeah. It seems to me that like the the technology field right now is um, very centered around like just a handful of large companies. That anytime something really interesting is being developed, uh, one of them will buy it up and um, will either continue 
developing it and then integrate it into their particular ecosystem, uh, or they buy it up and they you know shut it down. Uh, so it's it's I don't think that that is the healthiest. Uh, environment for for innovation to happen in um but it is the one that we are currently living in so mm. um yeah i i don't know what uh what the best solutions are you know do we do uh an elizabeth warren and break up these large companies into their smaller uh you know smaller companies that are focused on different things mm-hmm. um or what but uh i i definitely think that like creating technologies that are interoperable uh, is important. Um, I was very, very glad to see uh, earlier this week, um, I think the the news came out that um, Apple, Google, uh, Amazon, and Zigbee are working on a, um, you know, a smart home in Mm. like, System so that so that other manufacturers who are making smart home devices uh, will be able to just target this one technology, this one API, and it will work no matter what oh. like type of uh, user interface, what type of smart home hub uh, yeah. the consumer has bought. Um, I was getting very very concerned that we were just going to have a bunch of like walled ecosystems. Mm. Uh, in place that, and you know, if I if I chose to have a bunch of Google devices in my home that I would never ever be able to use, um, you know, products from some other company because they're targeting HomeKit instead. Um, so, like that that type of uh, uh, interoperability and cooperation, uh, I think is is very important. Um, it prevents, like it it allows all of these different devices and technologies and things that are being produced to compete with each other on their own merits instead of simply just like based Mm. on which large company did you align yourself with so yeah true so i don't know if where you have any robots or in your home like any robots you have um i let's see i can't think of any that are like robots in the sense that they um you know have like have physical actuators or anything like that um you know i i have a few uh smart home you know type things like Mm -hmm. i have a nest thermostat i have uh a lot of smart speakers throughout the house um i haven't gotten any like um any any uh smart locks or anything like that Mm -hmm. yet because uh, not like none of the ones that were out uh fit the needs that I had. Um, and also I don't want to contribute to, you know, like for example, I didn't, I don't have a ring, uh, doorbell because I don't want to contribute to, uh, police organizations (laughs) having, you know, like more and more video footage. Uh, (laughs) so. And if there's a robot you want to have in your home, what could be the robot you imagine something you would like to have in your home? In your yeah, imagination. I mean, I'm definitely late to the party on this one, but like having a Roomba or some sort of, um, you know, like s- smart uh, vacuum cleaner would be very useful uh, because like just, yeah, tasks like that, that mm. are, you know, I have to do on a regular basis um, that, you know, could easily be automated. Those are, those are definitely um, ripe for the picking. Um, the reason that I have a, a Nest thermostat already is because, of course, you know, that's a, a straightforward way for for us to save money on our heating bill um, by allowing that to use more data than just like you know a simple programmable thermostat because um, mm-hmm. it can turn down the temperature when everybody's away from home, not just when we expect everybody to be away from home based on like a weekly schedule or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. But. Do you think robots, because robots now is, is rigid and something it's not safe to have an interaction with human, and that's why I would like to ask you: Have you ever heard about uh, soft robotics? Your podcast is the first time that I had ever heard the term soft robotics, and uh, and I, I had to look it up to figure out like, okay, does is does this mean that it's like kind of robotics but kind of not oh no we literally just mean soft materials got it (laughs) um 
Yeah, so I, I don't know a whole lot about the advantages and disadvantages of like soft robotics versus using rigid materials. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, you know all of the the materials that we use in, in the robotics team uh, at at my high school. Yeah. Uh, th- those are all very very rigid uh, mm-hmm. materials, and uh, that's why no humans are allowed on the playing field when the robots are are. Uh, driving around and interacting with things um because yeah like we we put in you know these uh pneumatic pistons and things like that to uh to move parts of the robot around and they they move very very suddenly because you know we can't be bothered to it's it's when we're programming these things we're always like it's all or nothing just turn it on or turn it off we (laughs) we don't have a whole lot of nuance uh on how hard we want it to push um so yeah, like I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with mm-hmm. uh, with soft robotics. Mm. But what what do you think about it? So you think something it could be interesting or what your thoughts? Because you you just see soft robotics. Is there any thoughts yeah. come to you about that? I I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what kinds of things come out of the uh, the soft robotics field mm-hmm. um, because yeah, like not only I mean there, there's the safety aspect of it, like you said, but also just like a lot of people aren't going to want to have uh you know a robot that is made of uh rigid metal uh and interact with that on a daily basis right you mm-hmm. know softer materials uh are more desirable um even from like an aesthetic point of view like this isn't a robotics example but the um the the Google Home uh like especially like the Google Home Mini right is a is a device it's a it's a speaker where they covered the entire thing in kind of a, a soft fabric to you know give it kind of a more mm. homey feel um so that people are more more willing to put it out there where uh you know it can be seen and heard um because it, it doesn't look like an industrial object um yeah so i i definitely i i can't wait to see and and also you know i've 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 watched a few videos like veritasium did a video about um machines and you know simple simple mechanisms mm-hmm that use like flexible materials instead of rigid materials and how like there there are some things that are possible to do with flexible materials that aren't possible with rigid materials and so i'm definitely looking forward to seeing what kinds of like applications uh can be achieved using soft robotics mm-hmm. so if i ask you about how you can tell students to make the robots for the good use what message you can tell them if you can tell, you have to use it for the good. How you would deliver this? Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, usually when I when I'm having students do some sort of project, um, I I definitely have them consider the like, how would this be used in the broader world, right? You mm-hmm. know, here in class, of course, we're making just a simple little thing uh, to to demonstrate that we know how to do you know do this one technical technical task um but like how how would this be used in a broader context um i usually have them do some sort of write-up uh around that so yeah always always keeping in mind the uh the the broader social implications of things um is something that i try to instill in my students um i hope it comes across to them so in the next 100 years, what a thing you wish humanity can have or do? And would you imagine, what would you imagine the world would be? And if there is robotics or sort of advanced technology, how you would imagine this image in the next 100 years? Uh, in the next 100 years, I definitely hope uh, that medical technology especially has uh advanced quite a bit in that time um and that is 100 percent a uh a selfish desire because uh as a 27 year old i i think you know i i may be at that age where uh, i can actually live long enough for um for healthcare to continue to advance mm. uh and you know keep me and other people uh my age alive uh for the for the foreseeable future mm-hmm. 
and yeah eventually like continuing to improve like human computer interfaces um so that we can like not just interact uh you know with with the physical world but you know deepening our 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 ways of interacting with the digital world um so that um so that we can communicate more effectively with other people and also with you know computer algorithms um yeah i think the next hundred years are going to be kind of where it's at there's going to be a lot of big uh, mm. uh big revolutions in in the technology space in the next 100 years. Mm -hmm. So well, let me ask you, what was the best advice was given to you? And it was like life changing or maybe profession, professional or personal level. And do you agree that advice is important for you or? Oh, yeah, advice is super important for me. Um, I, I like I, I put a lot of effort into finding other people whom like whose whose opinions I trust and and who can give good advice um i think some of the some of the best advice that i have seen is like tr try to live my life i try to live my life in like in the world that i want to exist, right? Not necessarily the way that the world currently is. Um, so, you know, I, I try not to uh, get into the trap of like the hedonic treadmill, you know, I try to um, consume as little as little uh, as possible, because I understand that like, um, in the future, like the the economy won't be based on the same uh, principles of, of, uh, supplying everything and, you know, like continuing to increase our, uh, our, our economic output the way that it currently is. Um, and, uh, and so I, I'm trying to prepare myself for that world by, um, you know, needing less and also working less than, uh, than I could be. Um, and yeah, but a lot of that has been shaped by uh, a book called Robots Will Steal Your Job, which I read a few years ago as mm. um, research for a podcast episode. And I was so inspired by that book that uh, I actually, um, since there was no audiobook version of it, I went and recorded uh, an audiobook version of it myself and, uh, oh, and cool. put that up as a podcast feed. Um, so if anybody is interested in uh, in that, um, they can find it in their their favorite podcast player. That's very interesting. Yeah, I like it, this point. It's just like uh, to be oblivious to the real world. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say oblivious, but you know, <laughs> try like I'm actively trying to shape the world into the one that I want, while also uh, living the way as much you know as similar to the way that I will be in the world that I'm trying to create. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so um, we are going to the end. So, I, as you are a teacher and a broadcaster, I think this is a nice combination, and you have a lot of joy. Would like to be like a communicator. So, I don't know what's your goals for, for the future as your teacher and broadcaster. What's your dreams for the future? Do you like to integrate education and broadcasting in something new? What What are your thoughts for? Because it's still twenty seven, and there's a lot to to do in the coming years. Yeah. There's always a lot to do. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I have already integrated my teaching and podcasting mm -hmm. uh, pretty well um, because I like a lot of the topics that I cover on my show, The Extra Dimension, uh, are based on things that I teach in class. And so I, I made I made those podcast episodes both to help myself wrap my head around, you know, mm -hmm. that topic um, to make sure that I was prepared for it in class. But also like now I have a product that I can give to my students to have them listen to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, instead of like lecturing about this topic in class, I can give them this podcast episode to listen to uh, at home. And then in class we can, you know, do activities, do things that are that are more interactive, right? Um, to help them uh, kind of apply those concepts. Um, so yeah, and, and I didn't find out until uh, just earlier this year that uh, 
there there is a word for that kind of model. It's called the flipped classroom. Uh, so I was accidentally mm. doing a flipped classroom model without even knowing that that was something that uh, lots of teachers are getting into these days. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. So I would like to ask you finally if you have any final words for people who are listening to the podcast or any messages you would like to say at the end of the podcast. Um, well, a, a general message I would just say is uh, the, the future is uh, it's, it's looking pretty bright. Uh, I have a lot of hope for it. Um, and uh, as for self-promotional type things, um, people can follow me on Twitter mm-hmm. at Ian R. Buck, um, and they can find my, uh, my podcast, The Extra Dimension, uh, on just about any podcast player or on our website, thenexus.tv slash category slash TED. Perfect. Sure. That's very interesting. And, and I would like to thank you for your time. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. And on behalf of IEEE Software Box Podcast, uh, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Extra Dimension. Once again, if you want to hear more episodes of Marwa's podcast, you can search for the Soft Robotics podcast in your favorite podcast player. You can find Marwa on Twitter at Marwa Elduini. That's spelled M-A-R-W-A-E-L-D-I-W-I-N-Y. You may have noticed that this is the 50th episode of the Extra Dimension, which is exciting by itself, but it also, it falls in the month of the Extra Dimension's fifth anniversary. Uh, We originally launched this podcast back in January of 2015, and uh, 50 episodes later, I guess that means that we've been averaging 10 episodes per year, which is pretty darn good for a show that's supposed to be monthly. Um... Yeah, here we are. It's uh, it's been a fun journey so far, and we're going to uh, continue this as long as we can, uh, continue to explore different ways that technology intersects with other parts of our lives. For example, next month you can come back to hear an episode explaining the new COPPA law, which is uh, affecting a lot of online creators who Uh, have content that may or may not be considered to be intended for children. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash the Nexus TV. And if you are willing and able to support us financially as we continue to make technology-focused podcasts, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Unlike most of our episodes, this one is not released under a Creative Commons license uh, because this is owned by Marwa Elduini. So if you want to use any parts of it, uh, go ahead and contact her for more information. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological Convergence. Convergence.